Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome to World Communion Sunday. If you are joining us by television this morning or a social media platform, we want you to know we're delighted to have you here in the sanctuary and also joining us in social media. We hope this is a wonderful Sunday uh, uh, for you. If you're a first time visitor, we're so glad to have you here this morning. Uh, we consider ourselves a friendly church. We hope that uh, you feel very welcome and at home here and that you will come back. Now, you'll notice in your bulletin, you'll see my name actually up there right now saying Joe Brennan's doing the announcements, but you'll notice in the bulletin that it has uh, Brother Caleb's name there as well. However, this month is um, Pastor Appreciation Month. Let's have a round of applause for our pastors. And we thought it would be rather peculiar for Caleb to be applauding himself up here in front of here I am. So. So um, I'm going to jump right into the bulletin announcements. Uh, so if you open your bulletin in anticipation of this and flip the bulletin over and open it up, I'll jump into that. But before we do that, I want to hit a few announcements that are not in your bulletin. First out of the gate, church council members. Just a quick reminder that right after church council, or right after the service today, we are meeting in the conference room for a 15-minute church council meeting. So please remember to join us there in the conference room for just a quick meeting quick touch base meeting. Um, October, not in your bulletin also, October is Pastor Appreciation Month on Sunday, October 17th. During the morning worship hour, we will recognize our three pastors, Reverend Wesley Pepper, Reverend Caleb Holder, and Reverend Don McCain. We are so blessed and so fortunate to have these men and to have, uh, have the, the wonderful woman, women who have stood with them in their years in the ministry. We're so grateful for them. If you'd like to send them a note, a card, etc., in anticipation of our October 17 date, you can mail that to the church. But October 17 will be the big day for this. Please come. We want to celebrate our pastors. Uh, adopt a, a college student program. Deadline to sign up for this is Sunday, October 3rd. Christmas cantata. Johanna asked me to mention this. For those interested in participating in this year's Christmas cantata, rehearsals will be held immediately following morning worship each Sunday. Uh, and then also notice this is Communion Sunday, so any cash that's deposited at the Chancel Rail will go to our local missions. Okay, in your bulletin, start on the left side of your bulletin with me. We'll work our way toward the right. Uh, United Methodist Women will meet on Monday, that is tomorrow, October 4 at 1 p.m., right here in the lounge. Ladies, it's always a great time. Look forward to seeing you there. Wednesday night live, Wednesday, October 6th at 6 p.m. is our Wednesday night live, and the menu for this dinner is one of my personal favorites, spaghetti, homemade meatballs, salad, garlic bread, and dessert. It's just dinner, and it's just an hour, and it is a taste of Italy. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me tell y'all how that came about. So, so me and Rick Stanford and, and Dickie Miller made the meatballs Thursday morning. And now I'm not bragging because I've made plenty of stuff that didn't turn out well, but I believe they're the very best that I've ever made. And I bit into the first one and Rick looked at me and he said, what does it taste like, preacher? I said, like a little bite of Italy. <laughs> so uh, I'm really pleased with how the meatballs turned out. Y'all sign up and come and eat with us Wednesday. And Wesley said that in the breakfast this morning, and of course, me being Joe Brennan, I stole his line and used it just now. <laughs> um, Rise Against Hunger packing event is Wednesday, October 13 at 6 p.m. Our goal is to raise $7,181 and provide 15,000 meals to those in help. We have never missed that goal. We always do that. It's a wonderful thing to be able to give and be part of a community that does that. This is such a giving, generous church, does so many good things. Uh, children's ministry, family fall event right there in your bulletin. You'll see it there, Saturday, October 23. It's in New Albany, uh, and the time we leave the church at 8.30 in the morning. And there's all kinds of great things. Uh, uh, pumpkins, slides, jumping pillow. I'm not sure I know what that is. That's not like where you go to bed at night and the pillow's jumping up. That would be, that would be terrifying. Um, pony rides, goats, petting, zoo, wagon, train rides, uh, gift store, homemade caramel apples, fudge, baked goods, ice cream, lots of sugar. Uh, kids and parents, please come. Cost us $14 a person. If you're 18 months or younger, you go free. Charge conference in your bulletin. This year's charge conference for Amory First is Monday, October 25 at 6 p.m. Voting members... Uh, our church council and all clergy. It's a Zoom meeting. Uh, we're provided a link to join the meeting. 
I will share with our members. Please be in prayer for our church and wisdom for our church uh, leadership during this time of preparation. Uh, ministry celebration event in your bulletin during our November 3 Wednesday night meal. We actually celebrate and we recognize our various ministries here at Amory First. If you're curious about how many ministries go on here, and there are a lot, you should uh, come to this Wednesday night. It'll be awesome. Last but not least, All Saints Sunday, uh, right here November 7th. Um, it's a wonderful thing to remember the lives of those faithful members of Amory First United Methodist Church who have received their eternal blessing. I'm not sure if that's in the bulletin or not, but I'm announcing it now. November 7th, All Saints Sunday, right here at Amory First. And those are our announcements. Let's uh, welcome each other to the house of the Lord. Just turn and say hello to each other. If you're not, not comfortable shaking hands, that's fine, but just turn and greet the people around you. Just wave it, folks. Say, hey. Good morning. Good morning. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet and turn to page 159 as we join together in singing all four verses of Lift High the Cross, one of my very favorite hymns. We, we unite our hearts together in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, holy is your name in all places. And you are to be worshipped in spirit and truth. 
We adore you and we praise you for life and your love and salvation. Touch our hearts again with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word today. And bless us in your will. We pray one for another. For strength and wisdom. For faithfulness, for obedience. To be found serving, to be found loving others and giving of ourselves with generosity. To share the love of Christ. Verbally and in giving to reach the world for Christ. We love you, Lord, and we need your grace and your mercy. We're thankful for forgiveness, for forgiveness of sin, abundant life, for all your many gifts of family and home, of our nation, our freedoms. And we pray, God, today for our nation, for the nations of the world. We pray for peace and unity, an end of conflict and war, for our troops who serve in all places, for those locally officials and, dear Lord, caregivers, people in hospitals and nurses, doctors, first responders, mayors, governors, all whom it's our duty to pray for. And God, it's a privilege to pray. And we believe in prayer. You have answered countless prayers. For those today, dear Lord, in care of Christ and medicine, we pray for them. I would say a special prayer, God, for Aline, my mother-in-law, for her wellness. We're thankful for the lives that you touch for bringing new life, and for the privilege of worship today. We humbly ask, Lord, that every thought, every word, every hymn, every prayer, every gift, all that we do, honors you and reaches the world for the love of Christ. In his holy name we pray, for his sake only, amen. Ms. Eileen Bailey, my mother-in-law, is in the hospital, and she's critical. Uh, life expectancy is short, so pray for her. Eileen Bailey. Let's stand. We offer God our glory. Uh, just, a, just a note, too, about our first meal. Uh, we have a meal on the first Wednesday of the month. That is free of charge, and, and you all are welcome to come. It's just a time for us to gather and fellowship. But if you do want to come and try some of those meatballs that taste like a little bite of Italy, uh, make sure you drop your cards in the collection plate. Ushers, if you'll come forward, we'll worship you with our giving.
may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Nehemiah 1, 5 through 11. I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my family have sinned. We have offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. 
Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are under the farther skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place at which I have chosen to establish my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. At the time, I was cupbearer to the king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today is World Communion Sunday. And I'll be honest with you, when I was a younger preacher, I would have skipped World Communion Sunday. I would have ignored it. I would have thought, I have something way more important to focus on than World Communion Sunday or on communion itself. And thanks be to God that I have grown past that. Lord, thank you for helping me to mature in my understanding of the importance of this meal. Sometimes called the Lord's Supper, sometimes called Holy Communion, sometimes called the Eucharist. But how important it is because for 2,000 years it has been defining us. As a people. For 2,000 years, it has been at the very center of our worship. When we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are celebrating the salvation and the forgiveness and the reconciliation that Jesus Christ has made available to every single person on this earth. And brothers and sisters, that's pretty important. In Acts chapter 2, immediately following the day of Pentecost. So here they are, the, 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 the birthday of the church, the Holy Spirit. I mean, first of all, you got to remember, right? They're in this upper room. They're scared to death. They're afraid they're probably going to be arrested and maybe crucified too. And all of a sudden, the, the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin to speak in other languages and they go out and they begin to preach and to tell the story of Jesus. And at the end of Acts 2, we see that the church begins to grow fast. That thousands and thousands and thousands of people are added to the followers of Jesus Christ. The people of the way. That's what we're first called in Acts. But in Acts chapter 2, we find that one of the things that happens in Christian community is that they break the bread and they drink the cup, always lifting up the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. That's why we started this morning, by the way, choir, with lift high the cross. That was intentional. Me and Lynn didn't just open up the hymn book and throw a dart at it and say, boom, that one looks like a good one for world communion. No, this meal is about lifting up the salvation of the world. And that's why it is so very important. That's why during the pandemic when sometimes we weren't together like this, I kept on having communion with y'all through the internet. And I'm not sure that that was completely legit, Joe. But I couldn't see that denying the church communion was okay either.
And you know, somebody actually asked this past coffee with the pastor, by the way, the last Sunday of October, we will have 11 people join First United Methodist Church. And we're excited about that. But we had somebody ask at coffee with the pastor last Sunday afternoon, Preacher, why don't we just take communion on the first Sunday? Why don't we take it every Sunday? And I had to answer them honestly and truthfully because, you see, our founder, the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, would probably kick all the dirt off of his, of his grave if he knew that Methodist folks were only celebrating communion once a month. But it happened because when we moved when we became, when we went from being a movement to being a church in America we didn't have any preachers we had very few preachers and a whole bunch of congregants and Wesley believed that you had to have an ordained clergy person to celebrate holy communion and so back in the old days we celebrated communion once a month because that's when the ordained preacher showed up to celebrate it now, Wesley would be quite distraught if he knew we had as many preachers as we have now and we were not celebrating the meal every week. I mean, he, he was a good Anglican. Uh, he, he couldn't quite wrap his mind around that. And to be honest with you, I have Bible study. We talk about the text that I'm going to preach every Monday before I preach on Sunday, and we have a worship service with the staff, and we celebrate communion every single week together. So this, this meal has been important to Methodists and to Christians from the very, very beginning. Now let's just pause just for a second and jump back to Nehemiah. So the last time that we met Nehemiah, he had heard that Jerusalem was in shambles, that the walls had been knocked down and that the people were living in shame and he has this great burden to help and, and we talked about the fact that God is calling us to be burdened for what is wrong in the world to have a burden for it and then Nehemiah takes it one step further he prays and he fasts for days and days so that God can hone that burden shape that burden into what God needs it to be so that Nehemiah can go to Jerusalem and do what God is calling him to do. So that's the last time we met Nehemiah. We learned that Nehemiah was a Jew that had grown up in exile, that he was an assistant to the, to the king of Persia, Artaxerxes I, uh, and we remember that the Jews had been carried first into exile by the Babylonians and that in 539 B.C. Cyrus the Great had conquered the Babylonians and it became the Persian Achaemenid Empire and that Nehemiah is a Jew in exile. But he is a servant of the king of Persia. He is the king's cupbearer. So let's see just exactly what Nehemiah has to teach us about Holy Communion. They didn't even have communion then, but Nehemiah has something to teach us about Holy Communion and specifically about confession. This is the first prayer, recorded prayer, in the book of Nehemiah. And if you read this book, and I told you in the first sermon on Nehemiah that Nehemiah was a prayer. I mean, he'd just be talking with folks. Now, how would you like this? You're sitting here trying to have a serious conversation with somebody, and that person just pivot and start praying to God. Now, that'd be a wonderful way to get people to leave you alone. <laughs> I mean, that had to be effective, you know. Uh, hold on, now, just hold that thought. I need to pray about it. But we might even, Davis, make better decisions if we paused in the middle of those conversations and got down on our knees and prayed. 
Now, part of the reason Nehemiah takes that approach is when he winds up finally making it to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the wall, he has people that are waiting there to assassinate him. I don't know about y'all, but if people are waiting to assassinate me, that's probably going to prompt me to prayer. And so Nehemiah prays over and over and over again. But in chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, we have the first prayer in the book of Nehemiah. And it is so honest. And it is filled with confession. Now, y'all write this down. This is me. I didn't steal this from a preacher. This had to be from the Holy Ghost. I mean, I don't usually. Now, Caleb, he comes up with little catchy things all the time. I'm not that catchy. But here's point number one. You've got to have confession before you have communion. Hear me now. You've got to have confession before you have communion and so nehemiah is so honest this is the way we should pray don't pray to impress god jesus said right don't be like the pharisee standing on the street corner putting on a great big show for people to hear how holy and good you are but be honest be like the tax collector that says lord i'm a sinner and i need your help well that's how nehemiah is in this prayer he 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 says to god listen I'm a sinner. If you read it in the NIV, which is what I've actually been studying it in all week, he says, Lord, forgive me. Forgive Israel, but forgive me. And forgive my father's house for how we have contributed to the sin of Israel. Now, it's one thing to, to, to be able to say, Lord, be with Peggy. Forgive her, Lord. Bring her to repentance. Bring her to a place where she can experience the fullness of who you are. Lord, turn her from her evil ways. Now, Peggy ain't doing nothing that I know of, so don't be worried about Peggy. I'm just using her because she was the safest example over here. Yeah. Some of the rest of y'all, they would be thinking about stuff they'd heard, you know. I mean, I'm just saying. Peggy was safe. I knew she ain't been up to nothing. Mm -hmm. Y'all know it's the truth. Y'all know that's the truth. But it's one thing to be able to do that, and it's another thing to be able to say what? And you know what, God? I have been a part of the problem, too. I have contributed to the sin of Israel, too. My father has contributed to the sin of Israel, too. Now, that's a real man right there. It's able to be honest. But he's so burdened, and he wants to be a part of this healing process in Jerusalem that he just lays his cards out. He says, God, you said this would happen if we wandered away from you. And, and if you think about it, really, I mean, th here's the deal. If you don't understand the history of Israel, think of if Rhode Island became a state. I mean, a country, excuse me. If Rhode Island became a country. So you have this little bitty place that's about 200 miles long and about 80 miles wide. Is that close to right, Joe? Somewhere right in there. And it has the Babylonian and now Persian Empire to the north and Egypt to the south. And you're Rhode Island. That means that if you make it, you're going to make it because God has preserved you. Now, Israel's got a pretty good army now. They've got a pretty impressive air force. You know, you don't want to mess with Israel. But this is in the day where they had six swords, two knives, and, 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 one, and one machete. And that means if they were able to be there, it was because God had allowed it to happen. And so Nehemiah says in his prayer, Lord, you said this would happen if we turned our backs on you, that we would be scattered across the earth. And so, Lord, forgive us. <clears throat> and there's also, <coughs> excuse me, there's also something powerful about being the, see, he's like the, Nehemiah's like the, 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 the fuse being lit. There, there's something, did you know you could bring revival? That you can bring revival. Because, Nehemiah's repenting for folks, some of them who don't even care. But he says, I do, Lord. 
forgive me. Forgive Israel. And Lord, use me and use those few faithful people in Jerusalem to begin this process. So you want to have communion with God? It always begins with confession. Have you ever noticed in our hymnal, when we go through the communion liturgy, we always pray that prayer of confession, merciful God, forgive me because I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I've not heard the cry of the needy. We pray that. Y'all, that's not a fad. We didn't just start doing that 50 years ago or even 200 years ago. Did y'all know that the Didache, which was the first manual of worship, dated sometime between 60 A.D. and 100 A.D. First manual on worship that talks about holy communion and baptism. And the Didache calls on Christians to confess their sins before they receive the Lord's Supper. Why? Because those ancient Christians knew that you had to have confession before you could have communion. And I'm not just talking about the meal. All of us, that's why our lives, you know, one of the things that Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, about verse 15 or 16, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near you. Brothers and sisters, there's a reason, reason that confession and repentance is a part of our life. Because it's not just about one trip to the altar where we kneel down and we say to God, I am a sinner, save me, forgive me, heal me. But the problem is, is I'm going to sin probably after I leave church, maybe before I get out of the building. And so confession has to be a regular part of my life. Repentance has to be a regular part. A rerouting, a changing, if you will, has to be a regular part of my life. But confession and repentance always leads to sweet communion, whether bread and wine is involved or not. That's point number one. I don't need this. Why am I taking it with me? I'll take this up here. Miss Bobby, uh, you fuss at me for hiding the hymnals. Get that thing back so they don't take it out of my salary. Confession always comes before communion. And then here's the second point. Confession leads us to stand on what God's Word says. Did you hear Nehemiah in the text talking about what God had promised to Moses? You told Moses if we were unfaithful that you would scatter us. But you also told Moses that if we repented and turned to you, that you would gather us from the furthest horizon. Isn't that a beautiful promise? That you can't get so far away from God that he can't call you back to him. Now, I love that. Now, James, we've been talking about all that judgment in Revelation. But the truth of the matter is that most of us, as long as our heart's beating, God can get to us. He wants us back. And here's why when you pray, you ought to stand on the word of God. Let me get this. So Nehemiah, he reminds him, God, you said this, but you also said if we would confess and repent and turn to you, that you would call us back for the, from the furthest horizon. Here's why when you pray, you ought to, first of all, you ought to know what God's word says. That's why we're going through Revelation. Did y'all know about the... First Wednesday, excuse me, about the second Wednesday in November that I will have taught that book for five months. Five months. And here's why you need to know what's in God's Word. Because you need to know the promises of God in His Word. And here's why you ought to stand on them when you pray. Pray the Word of God over your life. And it's not because God forgets. You're not reminding Him. But you pray that to remind yourself of what the Word of God says. See, God doesn't forget. You're not, you know, I've seen sometimes people like praying, you know, like they trying to jump God, put the jumper cables on God and bounce him off. 
It's not a forgetting issue with God. You pray that to remind yourself of what the Word says. And brothers and sisters, the Bible says that the Word of God will not return void. Never. So stand on His Word. Two, two things. That's all i got to tell you this morning. Confession comes before communion. And when you pray, stand on the promises of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may follow along with the word of service and table in your bulletin and on the screens. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we, we confess, confess we have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have failed to be an obedient church. church. We, we have not done your will. will. We, have we have broken your law. law. We, we have, have rebelled, rebelled against your love. We have, have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ... You are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering. For us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, the children of God, let us pray. 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we're going to do something a little different. Joe and Laura and, and Tracy, if you will come down. Um, we are going to... Uh, we're going to invite people to come to the altar to receive communion this morning. If you're not able to kneel, you can stand at the altar. The, the ushers will direct you. We'll begin with the choir first. Uh, and so you will come and we will have stewards on both sides of the, of the uh, altar rail. Caleb and Laurel will be on one side and Joe and I will be on the other side. Uh, and Brother Don and Tracy will go downstairs to the nursery uh, as well as uh, to the television ministry. And, and Tracy, y'all's cup and chalice are in the back, back window there. So, uh, and also I think everybody here knows this, but you are welcome to, to share communion with us. This is not a Methodist table. This is the Lord's table. And I would not ever deny anyone the Lord's table. Also, if you're not able to come down at all and you want me to bring communion to you, I will, we will be happy to bring it to your pew as well. So, all right. Brother Don and Tracy, y'all can go downstairs. And Caleb, just to make a little bit of room, let's set this back towards the pulpit as carefully as we can. There we go. All right. Choir.
Everybody get served. Good deal. All right, let's stand and worship together on our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises. That's what Nehemiah did. Page 374, verses 1 through 4. I think he's going to transpose it after the third verse. Go forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.